Just ahead on American Black Journal, the nation's first black-owned and operated television station, WGPR, gets a special exhibit here at the Detroit Historical Museum. I'll talk with TV host Sean Robinson, whose career started at WGPR. Plus, we'll get an update on the opportunities for minorities and Detroiters at the new Red Wings Arena project. Don't go anywhere. American Black Journal starts right now. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. We're coming to you today from the Detroit Historical Museum. There's a new exhibit here at the museum that documents the history of the first black owned and operated television station in the country. WGPR TV 62 went on the air in Detroit in 1975. The station was the vision of broadcast pioneer Dr. William Banks, who wanted to provide opportunities for diverse faces and voices to appear on the television. WGPR gave African Americans valuable training and experience in the television industry, both on camera and behind the scenes. The station proved to be a springboard for many careers. Today, former WGPR employees are working in television and journalism here and all across the country. My next guest got their start at WGPR. Sean Robinson is a TV host, producer, and author, and Karen Hudson Samuels is the executive director of the WGPR Historical Society. Welcome, both of you. Thank you very to much. Detroit Thank you. Wonderful to so, be back in the D. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, so, talk about the start that you got, Sean at WGPR and where it's led you to. Well, um, it, it's led me to feel real old since I mean, I've got an exhibit at a museum. There's nothing right. that makes you feel old uh, than that. Right. Uh, but um, yes, I'm born and raised here in Detroit. My family is still here and always knew I wanted to go into television. One of my first uh, role models, uh, if you remember, uh, Beverly Payne. Yes. Yeah. I used to sit uh, in front of the Channel TV. Channel 2, uh, right. WJBK. It, it, and she was like, I think, the, uh, the first African-American female anchor on TV. And I used to, after I watched my cartoons, after I watched, you know, Kimba the White Lion and the Munsters and the Jetsons uh -huh. and the Flintstones and all that, my grandmother would have the TV on and I, I would sit and watch her. Uh, and just there was something about her. I, and I think that was one of my first role models and always wanted to get into the television business. Yeah. And so when I went away to school at Spelman College in Atlanta, um, came back my, after my junior year and applied for an internship at WGPR. And so I worked there during the summer, uh, then went back to school, and then after I graduated, got a job. Um, well, I worked there, as a matter of fact, they didn't hire. They didn't hire me first. They wanted me to come back as an intern, as an intern start again, working for right? free. Okay, <laughs> and then as a reporter and anchor, and then finally put me on the payroll and was there for several years. And it really gave me the foundation that I needed yeah. to go on to the other stations. I I ended up being at several different stations uh, throughout my career, but G WGPR was the foundation and gave me that experience that I needed. Yeah. Uh, Karen, how about you? Well, let me first, I, I, I want to leverage off of what Sean has just said because the exhibit, which is running right now, right. people can Here come on down, sure. it'll be up through April 3rd. Sean is featured in one of the exhibit themes yes. called yes. National Success Stories. And they got a crazy picture of me up there too. And it's they beautiful. Have, wait, they it's have one beautiful really great picture, picture. <laughs> yes, of me like on the red carpet. Then they have one for me actually anchoring uh, there. See, right. Those are hard but, to but look I know, at. like the right. hair. Yeah, the hair so just excuse the that. It's a before, uh, it's, it's a throwback. It's just a throwback. throwback. It's a throwback. <laughs> so obviously these National Success Stories are a result of, as Sean said, getting that foot in the door, as you know, when you're yeah. coming out of school, mm -hmm. what do you want to find? That first you job, need you, you need right. experience. And that's yeah. what GPR opened the doors to so many different people, including myself, yeah. like mm -hmm. Sean, I started as an intern. And um, at the end of the summer, they hired me <laughs> as an employee uh -huh. and I stayed for six years and I left as news director. Right. Right. And from that experience, I learned so much that mm -hmm. applied to many other fields that I became involved with. So it's a great 
story of broadcasting. It's a great Detroit story. Right. We're glad we're here at the museum, the Detroit Historical yeah, Museum. I say, remember, this is Detroit history <laughs> That's right. at this museum. And so it's going to be a wonderful, you bring your kids, bring uh, people who are studying broadcasting history. They're going to yeah. really learn a lot. Yeah, yeah. and you, I didn't realize when I was working at GPR that we were a part of history. Uh, right. Being right. the first African-American owned television station in the country. Mm -hmm. And also, I just found this out that we were the first 24-hour station? First 24-hour. Uh, right. yeah. TV used to go off yes. on most uh, right. stations yeah. at and like so 2 o'clock. National Anthem right. and then Snow. And then Snow. But not GPR. Right. We were on 24 hours. Right. And it's one of the criteria that earned us, us meaning the station, a Michigan Historical Marker, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which right. went up back in January 18th. It's there forever. But it was one of the criteria. So 24 hours on the air. Um, we also had a variety of programming, including mm -hmm. five different ethnic programs. That is so interesting. People don't know yes. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting story. People think about the scene. Yes. Right. You, you the start scene, there. Yes. Did you see the, <laughs> the scene? scene? So I have somebody, to say, wait, I okay, was... Okay, uh, <laughs> somebody here <laughs> okay, was so dancing I grew on up, the scene. <laughs> I grew know. up in the 1970s yes. and 1980s in Detroit, right, right, right. downtown. Yes. Uh, WGPR was just across Jefferson. Right from where I lived right. and uh, some high school friends and I decided uh, when we were sophomores, we were going to get onto the scene, so we really? okay. went over there. What and, did you wear? Uh, oh, <laughs> sure. Actually, okay. I, wore, I wore a sport coat and a shirt, and I had a scarf on, uh, <laughs> so that I was very stylish <laughs> back I, in the day. They, we are <laughs> waiting for the video, so I know. any time. Yeah, right. I, don't, I, you know, I don't think I want to see I the was on the scene one time. Uh, do you remember Fast Freddy? Oh, sure. Fast Freddy? Sure. Oh, my sure, God. Sure. Well, yeah, we had high school day on the scene, and I went to Cast Tech. <laughs> Who cares? Yes. And so we had high school day on the scene, and I wore I wore a white dress with a big old white flower in my hair, and I you could not tell me nothing. But see, that okay. was fun. It, you know I, what I remember about it was it, it was a chance to be on TV. Sure. And it, it seemed accessible. It seemed like right. a place that 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 could happen. When I was a 15 year old who had no TVs in, but also could not dance. <laughs> right. That wasn't a criteria. But I wanted to go do that, and so it was right. it was there. And that's uh, sort of part of that GPR story. Is, yes. Uh, it was more just a, it, it seemed there like it was more like a family than a, a, a workplace. Yeah, definitely, but also we were able to talk about the issues that were important to the African-American sure. community, yeah. the stories that you would not see on other newscasts. And I remember uh, we created, uh, I also hosted a talk show there, Strictly Speaking, right. and I remember calling the uh, mayor's office, Coleman Young's office, and trying to get him on as a guest. <laughs> they told me no, I don't know how many times. And then finally, he came he on the show. And that was a really, really big deal for us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, talk more about the exhibit here at the Historical Museum. What are the things in it? Uh, what, what will people learn uh, from coming to see it? I think what they'll learn, first of all, are who are the people who made it all happen, starting with the station founder and the founding pioneers, Dr. Mm -hmm. William Banks. Uh, they'll learn how he was able to, through a Republican president, get a broadcast license. You'll learn about the original programming. You'll learn about WGPR radio, which also operated in the same space sure. as a TV station. Uh, we have a segment called Behind the Scenes. People see folks on the air and figure, well, something magic happens in the background. And I tell people, for every person you see on the air, there are probably 10 people behind the scenes. Right. So right. they take them through that. Who's behind the scenes? We talked about the original programming. Well, what did that look like? Uh, and then we have a historic timeline. What was going on? Milestones within wow. GPR's history. Mm -hmm. What was going on nationally yeah. among African Americans of broadcasting and entertainment right. and so forth. So I think people, we want them to take away an appreciation and understanding of an important right. story sure. in history. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Stephen, you know, uh, as Karen said, this was a station that gave so many uh, African Americans opportunities start, yeah. that they didn't otherwise have. You know, I remember just trying to find a job right. here in Detroit at some of the other stations, the larger stations, and could not yeah. get a job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so then I was at 
uh, when I was at GPR that really gave me my foundation. It taught me, um, you know, how to edit. Not only it taught me how to be an anchor, yeah. but, but how to be a reporter. Yeah, yeah, behind the. Uh, it taught me how to edit. It taught me how to produce. It gave me so many skills that I took. Uh, throughout uh, my career with me. Yeah, uh, we see lots more black faces on television today mm -hmm. uh, than we did then, uh, and WGPR is gone, uh, sort of off the off the air. What role does black media, though, now play? Do you think the, that's different now than it was when GPR was starting uh, and was on the air? You know, in some ways, GPR was a forerunner. I think mm -hmm. what you see is that being emulated more because there's access to many more opportunities through cable, networks, sure. uh, social media, online news services, mm -hmm. The Root, I could name some. Yeah. And so, but it's they, a lot easier to sort of get something easier, started now a and lot have lots of people see it. A lot easier to get started, but it's having mm -hmm. that perspective and point of view for your audience, as Sean mm -hmm. mentioned, which was one of the characteristics that was very important to the founder, Dr. Banks, mm -hmm. that as the issues were coming through the day, the community, African-American ethnic minority community voices need, needed to be heard and understood. And so I think it's similar, it's just grown tremendously. Wow. Yeah. And it's so interesting, I think there's a very timely discussion, especially about diversity in Hollywood uh -huh. that I uh, cover sure. all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the issues is Hollywood um, doesn't make stories about uh, everybody. About our sure. They have this kind of repetitive mindset. Well, okay, this has been working, so let's keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And so when when I think about the correlation between that and WGPR and the fact that we told the stories that were important to our community. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you think about uh, Detroit uh, now, mm -hmm. without. WGPR. How different does the city seem mm. without that without that voice? We still have obviously uh, African American uh, media in town, mm -hmm. but that one seemed uh, when I was a kid to sort of stand out from everyone. It spoke else. to you directly, Stephen. That's yeah. part of what it, was. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it, it did, and I think it's that still happens. One of the things when we uh, exhibit concludes, and we're going to create a permanent museum at the studios on East Jefferson. Uh, you've been working and, on that for a while. Right, right? and yeah. so that will be an opportunity. Also, we might try to open up the door again mm -hmm. for young people to come in and get that, well, I have a passion, I have skills. They need to be applied and honed and mentored, <laughs> that's right. and that's, that's where those opportunities yeah. come in. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean, what do you tell young people when they ask you, uh, how do I get started? How do I become Sean Robinson? I mean, it's a very different path now than well, it was. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very different today. And what's, what's interesting is I tell a lot of young people that you have so many more opportunities to kind of make your way to where you ultimately want to be. Number one, online. We didn't have, you know, there was <laughs> right. no, no YouTube back then, no sure. nothing, no internet, yeah. no anything. So I tell them to you know, start using your voice in ways that we didn't have the opportunity to use before. So do a YouTube show, okay? Do a YouTube show. A lot of news directors and executive producers are looking at talent they online. See that. But I also tell them, the thing that's going to set you apart in this business as, any biz, in, as in any business is perseverance. Mm. No, believing, I just had a reporter today mm. say to me, John, I wanna be an entertainment reporter, but it's gonna be hard, yeah. isn't it? Look, honey, life is hard, right? okay? It's hard. Life is hard. So if you're going to come with that mindset, you're not going to make it. So it have a goal, stick with it, work hard, and use your creativity in many different ways. Yeah, yeah. And, and understand that that perseverance will pay off. That's yes, the hard, it will. That's it the will. Hard part. Because there are a lot of folks in Hollywood that ain't got much talent. <laughs> right. But, but they stay after it. They stay and they keep going. Trust right. me, I interview a lot of yeah. them. But they, you know, they keep at it, they keep at it, yeah. and there's something about them that people like. Yeah. So the, the perseverance, hard work, just keeping at it, uh, never getting discouraged. Because as you know, I, you know, folks will try to tear you down and right. tell you you can't they achieve will your tell dreams. You no. They will tell you no all the time. All yeah. you need is one yes. Okay. That's it. All right, Sean. Karen, thank you for being here. Okay, thank and I want to see the outfit uh, that we're scarf not looking. you wore. <laughs> we're not looking for this. Because yeah. I know you were getting we're down. I'm your hoping, mother. Funky hoping, chicken and all that, I hope man. that footage is buried somewhere <laughs> that no one can find it. All right, uh, coming up next, a minority-owned company is making sure Detroiters get opportunities in one of the city's largest development projects. But first, here's a look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. 
I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African-American life in Detroit. This week in 1971, model and actress Kenya Moore was born. In 1988, Anita Baker won two American Music Awards for her Rapture album. And in 1959, construction began on the first segment of the Chrysler Freeway, which helped to destroy a black neighborhood. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. We're coming to you from the Detroit Historical Museum where Detroit Public Television has just announced a partnership that will expand the station's coverage of Detroit's story. And of course, that story includes the revitalization of the city. Here in Midtown, the Illich family's new sports and entertainment district is dramatically changing the landscape. When the District Detroit is completed, the city will have a new state-of-the-art arena for the Red Wings plus 50 blocks of businesses, parks, restaurants, bars, and residential developments. More than $250 million in contracts have already been awarded for the project, with the majority of the work going to Detroit and Michigan companies. Joining me now from one of those companies is Olymp uh, that's uh, working with Olympia Development is Douglas Diggs, president and CEO of the Diggs Group Heritage. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you very much. Yeah. The, this is a, a great day, great topic, but I have to share my first TV interview yeah. was with Sean Robinson well, was it really? Strictly <laughs> Speaking. On WGPR? On WGPR. See, that's how small and, this town is, you talk is, right? about the, the connection. My father, who was a U.S. congressman, had a weekly TV show uh, on uh, that's WGPR, right. the I, Washington I Update. I remember that. that See, uh, it's, it's, this is the smallest town big in small America, town. right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about this new district. Uh, it was a pretty controversial idea uh, when it was pitched. The, the, the public subsidy for uh, the Red Wings arena is still one of the things that, that uh, sticks in some people's craws. Uh, I, I see the work that you're doing as uh, sort of coming behind that and making sure that if we're going to do this, uh, it should be done fairly. And right. the, the level of participation has got to include those people who live and work in the city. Absolutely. Absolutely, and early on, you know, and, and uh, you know, there has been discussion about public subsidy, but it's public investment. And I think what you're seeing through the work that we're doing and the commitment of the Illich family, early on, Chris Illich said, we're going to make sure that this is Michigan made, Detroit built. And part of that commitment is that 30% of all contracts to build the entire district and 51% of the workforce will be Detroit businesses and Detroit residents. Yeah. Um, and, and he has, has stuck to that commitment and we're seeing, seeing it play out. So with over $250 million in contracts, over 60% of that work has gone to Detroit businesses. We're hovering around 50% with the workforce um, and over 90% of that business or those contracts have gone to Michigan business. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about trying to uh, ensure that kind of inclusion, there are a lot of hurdles uh, to, to doing that still, uh, even in a city uh, like Detroit. Talk about how you, how you find the businesses uh, who, who can do the work and, and, uh, and how you sort of uh, give opportunity to people that if, if you work on this, now you're going to be able to do some other things with your business in the future. Right. And so one of the things, you know, early on we held several outreach events, both businesses and residents, kind of tailored around the event center. But all along, we've had businesses who are interested, you know, if you're, you know, if you can build, uh, build out a small retail store, but you can't build an arena, register at districtdetroit.com. Right. And so we're starting to work with those companies as a district as we move beyond just the event center and move into other opportunities. We have a wealth of businesses who have registered and we'll begin working with them. So we've, you know, kind of behind the scenes, not the big fanfare. We're working with companies to help them get their bonding, help them get insurance, understand how you do bidding working with the unions and the skilled trades to develop programs uh, so we get our Detroit residents working on this. Yeah, uh, I, I live not too far from uh, where the arena is now taking shape and I have to say I drive by it uh, every day and it seems like you know it's sort of a shoemaker's elves kind of uh, story down there. It, it is moving really quickly uh, every night it seems like they are doing uh, in an impressive amount of work and we're going to see a building there soon. Absolutely. Uh, but of course this is not just about that arena, it's about 
uh, the, that whole area. Talk about uh, over time, what, what are some of the other things that we're going to see happen? Uh, so you'll see um, hotels coming in. You, the Wayne State uh, Business School the new announcement business school, was sure. made. Um, residential units, a wealth of uh, residential units will come in. Retail, and we're starting to turn our attention to retail. We'll be working with the Michigan Black Chamber and other um, ethnic chambers to make sure there are opportunities in the district for businesses. So we have a Louisiana Creole gumbo moving from, uh, you know, opening a second location, creating those opportunities for Detroit businesses in the district. Yeah. Um, when, you, uh, when you're working with these businesses over time, will they be able to stay involved uh, throughout the entire process? I mean, how many years uh, do you expect that this will create so uh, opportunity? We're going to be building structures over there for a long yeah. time. Because <laughs> <It's laughs> there's really nothing area. there right now. There's, there's nothing there. Um, it, it, you know, not a lot there. There are a few structures which yeah. will be rehabbed. But for the most part, you'll see a lot of new, uh, new construction coming along. There'll be the new Little Caesars headquarters um, going in the area. Um, you know, there'll be a significant amount of development. There'll be opportunities for businesses. And, and the key is for those businesses who aren't quite ready right now, yeah. you know, working with them now so that as the opportunities come along, they're ready for those. Yeah. Uh, th that neighborhood, uh, which is, uh, I, some people call it Midtown, some of us, uh, like me, grew up here in the 70s, 80s, know it better as the Cass Corridor. Uh, there's, of course, all kinds of tension around who calls which neighborhood what. Right. Uh, but the Cass Corridor itself had uh, an important history here uh, in the city. What's, what are some of the efforts to sort of maintain some of that character, uh, recognize some of that history, even as you bring in uh, new things? Well, the de development plan has been very focused on making this, on building of the fabric of Detroit and making this uh, d the Detroit Entertainment District. Right. You know, we're not trying to build Disney World, so we <laughs> want to build the fabric of the community, yeah. working with Cass Tech, working with other partners in the area to make sure that, that we're a good partner and this district grows together and, and you know, just like the Fox Theater, you probably remember the days of uh, karate sure. movies yeah. and your feet sticking to the <laughs> right. floor. Right. <laughs> um, right. You know, the Illiches came in, put a significant commitment in that, moved their headquarters there, rehab, uh, rehab that facility, keeping the characteristic of it. And I think you'll see that throughout the district. Yeah. Uh, in addition to this project, we're also likely to see uh, the bridge project uh, down the river take off soon. Uh, there are some other big, uh, large-scale developments uh, uh, taking place in Detroit, and I think that raises the question of whether we have enough, uh, enough people, enough businesses sort of lined up to be able to handle all the work. Uh, do you think that's going to that's going to work for well, us? Well, as as a small business owner, I can say. <laughs> You know, we're always willing to accept <laughs> the more, more the work. Merrier, right? <laughs> the more the right, merrier, that's right. a good problem to have. But making sure um, that people are, are but, in position to be able to take advantage. Certainly, and, and that's uh, why working with the skilled trades and working with the um, um, appren various apprenticeship programs, workforce programs is critical. Because we understand um, we, may, we have to develop a workforce you know, just like with the businesses, so that we catch up on the next project that comes down the pipe. They may not be able to, to work on the arena, right. but let's make sure we get people in the pipeline and, uh, you know, a great living wage. Yes. This, this truly is, the goal is to, for this truly to be a catalyst project for the city. Yeah. Uh, does this connect directly to efforts that are going on in neighborhoods? I mean, we're starting to talk about in Detroit, uh, uh, taking the things that are happening in the downtown, midtown uh, area and spilling them over into the neighborhoods. How does the, the, the money that we're spending here connect to that effort? Well, I mean, it, it creates the economic base uh, for people to reinvest in the housing stock in the neighborhood, to make purchases at neighborhood businesses. Um, you know, that's the key. And what you find, local businesses usually hire local people. Sure. And, and so that's the biggest spinoff impact. What's happening downtown, that bleeds out into the communities because those people leave the construction site and go home to a house. And, go <laughs> and they right. go, they're going to a neighborhood. And, uh, and, and that economic impact 
will continue to uplift the entire city. Yeah, uh, if you think of the places like uh, the Livernois um, uh, Six Mile Corridor, where, where there's a lot of focus, uh, you said earlier um, uh, you, you would like to bring some retail into this Midtown uh, Corridor. We're seeing some limited success, uh, success with those things in, in those areas, but we still haven't cracked that nut in downtown. Uh, what will be different about this district that will support uh, retail? So my team works with our, um, with our group who will be you know, doing the leasing for, for the retail spaces. And we're making sure that Detroit businesses are part of that, uh, are part of that process. And once again, we have you know, a lot of businesses right there on Livernois who probably could come down and open uh, up tomorrow. Uh, right. Um, we'd like to have those businesses come down, come down to the district, open up. But we also understand there's some businesses, there's some people who have a great idea, not quite, not quite ready, you yeah. know, still repairing the car right. in the front yard. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, you know, so that's why we're working with the Michigan Black Chamber on the business incubator program to get them ready um, so that they will be able to take yeah. advantage of the opportunity, whether it's in the district or back in the neighborhood. Yeah, well, and the key to that, of course, is density, which is the idea behind this whole project. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can't stress enough the goal is for this to be a catalyst project yeah. to, to create the density, the people, and to, to have the economic impact so we can move our entire city forward. All right. Uh, good luck and thanks Thank for you. being here. Thank yeah. you very much. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, you can also hear our program on WDET 1019 FM. We'll see you next time. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.